A very good evening and welcome to the Marianne Minor Cook Athenaeum. My name is Xuan Yeo and I'm one of the two Earth Fellows this year. A cursory glance at the news headlines every day provides a sobering reminder of the multitude of threats that our world faces. Terrorism, crippling diseases, nuclear proliferation, great power competition, cyber attacks, melting glaciers, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. In a landscape seemingly fraught with all kinds of dangers and risks, it is important that we arrive at a deeper and fuller understanding of these threats so as to identify potential counter responses and perhaps opportunities. Thomas Anderson directs the Center for Strate Strategic and International Studies Transnational Threats Project, where he investigates terrorism, transnational crime, global trends, and intelligence issues. He has conducted field research in more than 70 countries and has authored or co-authored 15 reports, as well as opinion pieces, debates, and articles that have been published in The Economist, The New York Times, The Washington Post, The West Point Counterterrorism Center Sentinel, and the Harvard Asia Pacific Review. He engages a variety of sources, including journalists, terrorists, traffickers, foreign intelligence officials, non-governmental organizations, and academics. He also serves as a course instructor and consultant for the US government and the private sector on terrorism, geopolitics, and global threats, and often provides expert commentary for the media and courts of law. Thomas Anderson is the spring 2016 speaker for the Respublica Society Speaker Series. As always, I must remind you that audio and visual recording is strictly prohibited. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Thomas Anderson to the Athenaeum. I think I've met the future national security advisors of Finland and Singapore tonight, <laughs> for sure. Very impressive students. Actually, everyone here has been outstanding. I had the chance to speak to alums and supporters and some of your parents at uh, the California Club today. It was fantastic. And I um, sat down with Michael and Christine to speak to the IR Club later uh, this afternoon, which was great. And had a lot of good conversations with people here. And uh, it's been a lot of fun. Um, thank you for the invitation. Thank you again, Priya, and thank you, Dot, for doing so much to facilitate this. It's been super smooth and very good. Um, I want to move around a little bit. Can you hear me okay? Still here in the back? Okay, great. <clears throat> There's so much content here that I'm just going to jump right into it, and then we'll do a Q&A at the end. So this is what we'll cover. Now, this is actually a... <laughs> So this is actually a two-day class I teach for the US government, and it's been boiled down. Um, so we'll touch on, on each of these, but uh, some more than others. Tomorrow I'm doing three 45-minute um, pieces on systemic disorder, ISIS, and then it's not on there, but it's a little bit of this, the view from the field, how you conduct field work in hostile territory. And it's, uh, it'll be pretty interesting. So I'll go heavy into ISIS, global trends, and which includes the food, demographics, health, and other things tomorrow. Hope you can join. So sources, very important. Where am I getting this information? Number one is definitely going on to the ground overseas. But all these other media sources and reports and institutions <clears throat> are extremely helpful in providing me with the background I need before going over. And I have tremendous resources at CSIS. Christine and Michael were uh, at CSIS last summer. And so I have 160 scholars there that I can talk to. So field work, the most important is where I've been in the last five years, some of those places five or six times. I'll move back and forth. Um, and I'll tell you, there's uh, not many stable countries on this list. Some are, some are not. And it's been a tremendous experience and advantage to get on the ground. So what's our methodology? Well, it's certainly desktop research. So you have to do your work at your desk, get online, actually read some books, magazines, Financial Times, um, <clears throat> and do all of that. And then you talk to folks in government, and not just the US government, but Pakistani and Russian and Chinese and Israeli, you name it, to talk about what the issues are. But especially the US government, which has the most eyes and ears on the world, to get a sense of where the gaps and seams are. Those are the words of Admiral McRaven, the SOCOM chief, the Navy SEAL chief who ran the Bin Laden operation, was we met with him several times and he said, this is extremely helpful for filling gaps and seams in our understanding and knowledge of the threat. <clears throat> SME, subject matter experts, we talked to dozens of them before each trip. 
then the field research, two to three months a year, expert review, and then we brief it out to our key audiences. Intelligence community, special operations, policymakers at state and Pentagon, members of Congress, and then the public, the media, and the private sector. So what does CSIS do? We do independent research overseas and in the United States on a wide range of national security topics meant to inform the perspective of those making foreign and security policy. They don't have the time often, they sometimes don't have the expertise on their staff, or they're covering so many things, or they're in a political environment in which doing unbiased research becomes very difficult to do, and that's why CSIS comes in along with other groups to provide that for them. So what do I want to come out of this? I hope this uh, presentation today and also tomorrow is a better sense of what's going on out there. Now, these are very, very uh, numerous, but nonetheless, I hope that some of you uh, do get a better understanding to see, importantly, that there's not often a good plan A and there's often not a plan B. So think about that when you criticize members of government, which are often deserving of criticism, but it is very difficult in the world we have today to come up with a good plan. <clears throat> so lots of people have different views on global threats and what's out there. So here's a view from the Director of National Intelligence who's about to give his testimony on worldwide threats. So every February, the DNI, General Clapper, and then the Director of the National Counterterrorism Center, and the FBI Director, Jim Comey, will go before Congress in both an open, unclassified session and then a closed, classified session to discuss what's going on. So this is the view from the US. Here's Russia's view. UK, business, and another view from WEF. So lots of different ways to look at global threats and trends. So we have tremendous systemic disorder in the words of William Hague. It is a very tough world out there where there's a lot less structure than there was before. When I was in college, the Soviet Union was dissolving in my junior year. Uh, it was when the wall came down in Berlin, and then by the time I graduated, the Soviet Union had been out of business for five and a half months. And that was quite a shock. And Zbig Brzezinski, the National Security Advisor under President Carter, who's at CSIS, says this is unprecedented instability. He's never seen anything like this in his life. And he says it's because of the lack of structure in the globe. A lot of super-empowered actors. <clears throat> so that disorder is the new order. We have a China that is very assertive, aggressive sometimes, but also careful. They take the long view. They look at what's happening. They consider the relationships with the US and others. Russia, more defensive. Less to lose than the Chinese do in confronting the United States. China likes to see America in rough waters because it keeps us from containing them in their perspective. But we also do $600 billion a year in two-way trade with China. The US does $25 billion a year with Russia. So Russia has a lot less to lose in a confrontation with the US. <clears throat> Both of those states and non-state actors are challenging what remains a US-led system, though far less than it was before. There is an incredible sense of empowerment. Think of all the people across the Middle East and North Africa who saw dictators brought down. Governments changed at their hands, oftentimes without weapons. Now that's incredibly empowering. They saw Al-Qaeda give the United States a bloody nose on 9-11. Very empowering to a lot of people. That's negative empowerment in that case, but the Arab Spring has been very positive empowerment, but the results have been very mixed, for sure. <clears throat> we have very assertive regional actors. Countries that were boxed in during the Cold War, either part of the East Bloc, the West Bloc, or the India-led non-aligned movement. Well, now they're spreading their wings and acting in ways that they did not do before, ever, or for a long time. There's four examples. Not all of it negative, but nonetheless, countries doing things that the US and Russia and, and NATO didn't see before, now they have to manage more assertive actors. That causes trouble sometimes. Cyber threats, top of the tier. Absolutely a very difficult thing to handle. Good news, everyone's living longer, men and women around the world, but fewer people are having kids. So what used to be the standard age dependency paradigm of five 
workers at the bottom for one retiree at the top has now moved a little bit like this for the developed world and is in fact going in this direction for South Korea, Singapore, you know, where you have fewer than one uh, live birth per woman. Very, very troublesome. Replacement for a population is 2.1 births per woman. Global recession, definitely not gone. In the US, we have decent growth, but worldwide, this recession is not gone. And in many parts of America, it's not gone. And then th factors that people thought were not core security issues in the past, or even security issues at all, are fundamental security issues today. Food, water, energy, crime, other issues like that. And this all gives us a landscape that is very difficult to maneuver in. Here's 20 issues, random order. You could come up with 20 completely different issues. These are 20 things that I think are important to look at. This is fascinating. You can print in 300 materials now, chocolate to carbon fiber. You can make guns, engine parts, okay, that can handle high pressure and high temperature. That means make your own drone, make your own gun. China, the most important actor for the United States and the most important actor for many countries. Around 67 or 70 countries call China their number one trading partner. And about 82, 83, I'm not sure exactly where the number is today, call it their number one or number two trading partner. That's serious influence. China's top five trading partners, US, Hong Kong, Taiwan, South Korea, Japan. Three treaty allies of the United States, meaning if those countries, Taiwan, Japan, and South Korea are attacked, the US under treaty has to come to their defense, and then Hong Kong. That's very good interconnections between countries. It makes combat and conflict less likely, but not impossible. So China's going through a lot of changes. I'm gonna speed through these. We don't have a ton of time, but in the Asia context, there's been peace for a long time, one of the most peaceful parts of the world. The US has been the guarantor of that peace and has given space for China to rise. I'm not suggesting we're responsible for China's prosperity. They've had 10.1% growth every year since 1980. They've worked very hard for that, but they've been able to do it in an environment that's peaceful, that is without a doubt guaranteed and produced by the United States. Now China feels that we're constraining their rise. We do have some issues with the way China conducts its foreign policy and what happens domestically, which China says is none of our business. Nonetheless, that rise is getting to the point where the U.S. is quite concerned about things like island building, uh, some of the military developments they've had there. Uh, and China's concerned about our efforts too. I mentioned to the group today at the hotel, one of the best pieces of insight I ever gathered was when I was a fellow at Fudan University in Shanghai. And I interviewed 40 people for this project on missile defense. And this one People's Liberation Army colonel said to me, I, said to, I asked him, What's China's message and disposition towards the United States in Asia? And he said, our message to you is back off, but don't back out of Asia. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, Japan. He said, we don't want you on our front door. We don't want you in Taiwan, but don't leave the neighborhood because if you do, China's recognition that we've been holding the umbrella over, the defense umbrella over Japan, Japan rearms. And so they're concerned about that. We have assertive leaders in Asia now. And we haven't had many very assertive, outward-looking leaders. And we have them in China, and we have them in Japan. We have a highly competent leader in South Korea and in Taiwan now. Um, there's the potential for problems here. Leadership, some of the most effective leadership we've seen in decades in China, but now concerned about whether they can manage a very troubled economy. There is a slowdown. They still trade with a tremendous number of people, robust with the United States and many others, but we're probably, I'm not an economist, but we're probably in the four to 5% growth range, which is double US growth. But for China, that's bad news. Energy and pollution, even bigger news. 750,000 people a year dying in China from premature mortality associated directly with pollution. Okay, and over $230 billion in cost to the nation in lost wages and in cleanup. Domestic tension, the, inter the interior security budget is bigger than the People's Liberation Army budget for foreign affairs, for defense. That's a good indication that inside the house, things are not all right. And population, stable. Uh, you can now have two kids in certain parts of the country, but um, 
nonetheless, uh, there are some issues. One of the issues is corruption. <clears throat> and Xi Jinping is pursuing the tigers, the senior officials, and the flies, the lower officials. And he got the biggest tiger ever, the first member of the Standing Committee of the Politburo to be canned, and it's Zhou Yang Kang former head of all the secret police inside China, and this guy's sitting in jail, and look what they did to him. Now, all senior leaders in China put black shoe polish in their hair. It's about virility, it's about making sure the population sees them as strong, and as soon as he was knocked out, away went the die. Now, this is Shanghai, and you can barely see the buildings. You go to Beijing in the winter, when they're burning their high sulfur, low quality coal, and you cannot often see the buildings. Picture I took out in Xinjiang, in Urumqi, it's like Potter. Amazing how uh, China has water, similar to the Western United States. People's Liberation Army headquarters in Hong Kong. Now, there's been a lot of tension in Hong Kong over the choice, who gets to choose and manage the choice of Hong Kong's chief executive. Another flashpoint for China. One of the most fascinating things happened in foreign affairs in 2008. Russia invades Georgia. Okay. Earlier that year, it was August they invaded, earlier that year, the US recognized Kosovo and asked, and lots of other countries around the world lined up and recognized Kosovo. The Russians were furious over it. In August, they invade Georgia. And Russia wants, um, South Ossetia and Abkhazia, I think it is, the two on Russian enclaves, to be recognized as sovereign states. And so they turn to their friends in the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, and they say, get to it. Guess who vetoed that? China. Why would China do that? Because China doesn't want people recognizing Xinjiang, Taiwan, Hong Kong, or Nepal, uh, Tibet. Okay, so they exerted pressure on the SCO members very impressively and embarrassed the Russians over this. And it was because of domestic issues, not because of foreign policy issues. Went to a Uyghur protest over the 2009 massacre in Xinjiang, uh, which was in Munich. Let's go to foreign policy military issues. Tremendous tension with the neighbors. Uh, are they partners with Russia? Only nominally in a couple of ways. They are not that friendly at all. There's tremendous mistrust. Don't forget during the Sino-Soviet conflict in the 50s and 60s, each country had 500,000 troops on their mutual border. There was a very, very uh, good chance that they were going to have open combat with them. China does feel constrained, so they've set up parallel institutions in their own efforts to expand economically and to expand their influence. The most important of those, I think, has been the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank with an initial capital of $50 billion, and all of America's allies ran to join it, saying, hey, this is a great opportunity, and the US missed the boat on this one. US-China relations, good. Competitors, cooperative, sometimes there's friction, a lot of times there's friction. China has a lot of arrows in their quiver. Um, they've got a big army, they've got a big economy, number one in the world on a purchasing power parity basis. They have soft power. They have UN Permanent Five veto power. Trade with incredible number of countries. PLA is shrinking the ground force, but the Navy and the Air Force are getting more money. Are they a partner or a hegemon? Depends who you talk to. They're both, depending on where you sit. Prognosis, decent though. A lot of concern about management of the economy. Going to skip through that just for time. There's the uh, uh, AIIB signing. This is the SCO. It's not a very happy club, but, um, <laughs> but China, China dominates it. It's the stands, China, Russia, and a couple of others. Pretty good relationship between our countries and between these two gentlemen. Here is the problem. China wants to reassert itself over islands well off its coast and assert control over them in this building. Here you just see a little sandbar and then a submerged area, the reef here. China has pulled up sand, vacuumed it up, created a little harbor and a runway, and has put artillery on it. And is claiming these are Chinese territory, therefore they can control a much larger part of the South China Seas. Now the US has said, nope, 
we're not going for this, and we need to protect the interests of freedom of navigation, et cetera. So they flew this over some of the uh, areas that were claimed, as well as sent ships just last week through some of these areas. B-52 runs went through the air defense identification zone that China declared recently. Here's China's first aircraft carrier. Now, China is a big country. They've got the biggest economy in the world. They deserve to have a big military to protect their interests. But the island building and claiming is, I would say, way too far. And here it is, the nine dash line. This is the claim of their territorial waters. Oops, it overlaps with all these other countries. Not friendly, not a good relationship. And he has the whip hand, no doubt about it. Russians wanted to sell gas and oil to the Chinese for a long time. The Chinese said, not at that price. And then once we started to put sanctions on them and the Europeans started to put the screws to Gazprom over their deals in Europe, supplying 33% of Europe's gas, the Chinese said, here's the price, and the Russians had to agree to it. 400 billion sounds like a lot, but it wasn't. The Russians did not get a good deal. China around the world, in Africa, in the Middle East, in Europe, and in the Western Hemisphere. The rejuvenated Silk Road, maritime and land-based, China put $60 billion into this. Russia, tremendous tension with us, with the West and lots of others. They are still a crumbling brick. They used to be part of this group that Goldman Sachs identified for developing countries that were growing at an incredible rate, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and now South Africa. <clears throat> well, Russia really hasn't been doing all that well. And a few years ago, they were depopulating at the rate of 7,000 people a day. Unprecedented for an industrialized country. 7,000 people a day would um, reduce the population. Mostly men, heart disease, accidents, alcohol-induced. Uh, they have, from their perspective, done a very good job in Syria right now. They have put Assad in a much better position. He was very close to being toppled. They came in at the nick of time, kind of took the baton from the Iranians in terms of protecting him. Iran's still there in a big way. They are killing Turkey's favorite militant group inside of Syria, or Ar al-Sham, and they are aiming their guns at any foreign fighter that has come out of the former Soviet Union. There's a couple thousand that have come from the stands and from Russia, and they want to get rid of every single one of them. Understandable in that perspective. Putin's promised the military over $700 billion in a decade. He won't get there, but he has certainly improved the military. They want respect and influence, they fear marginalization, among other things. They have very good agile decision making because this is an autocratic state, but there are cracks and it's because of the economy. They are a one trick pony on energy. They have the world's total largest, largest total fossil fuel reserves, coal, oil, and gas. But that's not good when oil is at this price. A lot of points of friction with the West and with others. Many arrows in their quiver scientific industrial base that is still good in some ways, credible minerals, the oil, gas, and coal, um, military power, UNP5, uh, the ability to browbeat neighbors, which is not always good, but nonetheless, they have a tremendous power in doing that. Prognosis, not very good. They've been spending down their foreign exchange reserves in a big way. Some of the examples of tension we've seen armor inside of Ukraine. Putin's put the nuclear gun on the table. He has said, don't forget, Russia is a nuclear power. He was not talking about energy. He's shown willingness to bend on Assad, who I had the chance to sit down with in 2008. These are black tulip memorials for Afghanistan in many cities across Russia that list the dead from that war. Could we have new ones for Ukraine and Syria coming down the Pike, possibly. Okay, chaos across MENA. <clears throat> okay, lots of excitement about what happened after uh, December 2010, January 2011, February, March, dictators start to fall. We're going to have transparent government. We're going to have wealth distribution. We're going to have health care and education that means something. And what happened? Big thud. Nothing. First of all, it takes a long time to do that, but a lot of people out there with unmet expectations, huge hangover. And at the heart of it is still terrible governance and terrible economies. You don't just suddenly 
become a modern economy. What we did in Iraq was a huge mistake, and I'm happy to debate that with any single person who thinks otherwise. A huge mistake, and we're paying for it in so many ways, and part of it is what we see now. Local government, to go back to this, tremendously corrupt, don't want to govern, can't govern, and marginalize people economically, politically, culturally. And sectarian differences are huge. So great, no one wants to govern. Well, here comes my group, Al-Qaeda, ISIS, et cetera, et cetera. We offer a model. Now, as Arab states are falling across the region and have fallen and not gotten up, Islamic State rises. The Islamic State is more of a state in many ways than Iraq and Yemen and Libya. They're doing things, and it is better governance for those local people than what they had before. It's harsh, but it is better. Syria, long time before they're going to rebuild. Uh, social media advantages are incredible for militants. We simply cannot match them. Madison Avenue can get you to buy anything, okay? But we cannot get people to see us broadly, the West and others, and our allies in the, in the region, as good people. Okay, we cannot do it. They are much more agile in countering us. <clears throat> 11 million people. Do you know what percentage of the Syrian population that is? It's about half. So think of 160 million Americans or 650 million Chinese who have to leave their country or move to a different part of the country into tent camps. That's the equivalent of what's happened in Syria. It's really remarkable. And Turkey has not been our friend. They have allowed fighters from around the world to come in, specifically to kill Kurds, who they see as their fundamental threat. They don't see ISIS as a big threat. And again, the broad sense of empowerment in the region. Mubarak, former leader in Egypt, that's his headquarters that was burned during the Arab Spring. Still a lot of trouble here. It's been relatively quiet until late, until recently. Um, Al-Qaeda and ISIS not making a lot of chatter about them, but we've got big problems again. <clears throat> Here's the interview with Assad in 07. Me, John Altman, our Middle East chief, and Tony Cordesman, the Arlie Burke chair in strategy, the top briefer on the Middle East and on geostrategy in Washington. Absolutely phenomenal. And the man of the hour, very unpopular. <clears throat> so let's look at ISIS. Little background video here. The Islamic State of Iraq and Al Sham or ISIS is at the vanguard of global terrorism. From its self declared caliphate straddling eastern Syria and western Iraq, ISIS governs 10 million people under an effective, if harsh, regime. ISIS operates a resilient funding structure using the oil trade, extortion, kidnap for ransom, and antiquities trafficking. Other relics are destroyed as forbidden examples of idolatry. The absolutist extremist Sunni group targets all, from Shiites and Kurds to Sunni tribes and journalists. ISIS success in battle and governance, propagated by a savvy media campaign issuing 90,000 daily images and messages, gives it persistent global reach. ISIS is fortified by tens of thousands of fighters from around the globe, recruiting easily from the marginalized, while calling on others to attack in place. Tunisia is the number one source of fighters, while Turkey has long facilitated their access to Syria. Despite practicing so-called theologically sanctioned rape, ISIS also counts women among its ranks. ISIS claims outposts and alliances across the world, including Libya, Nigeria, Egypt, Pakistan, the Philippines, Russia, and elsewhere. Its initial rapid assault across Iraq dragged the U.S. and others back to the region in an anti-ISIS coalition. A Syrian regime in jeopardy of falling to ISIS and other groups prompted a robust intervention by Iran, Lebanese Hezbollah, Shiite volunteers, and the Russian military. ISIS brutality plays a key role in the refugee exodus. Reliable funding, battlefield prowess, foreign volunteers, sophisticated propaganda, Sunni marginalization, and a weak global response promise years of struggle ahead with ISIS. Quite a nice little mess we have there. Oops. The Islamic State of Iraq. There we go. So you saw the uh, ISIS flag there, and some of you may know what it is. I know some of you know what it is. 
uh, because it's the Shahada. It's the testament to the oneness of God. And, of course, it is being used in a way it wasn't intended. It is one of five um, obligations or pillars of Islam, along with prayer, zakat, fasting, and making the hajj once in, at least once in your life. <clears throat> so the battle space in which ISIS operates. Here's the recipe. There are other components, I'm sure, but some of the main ones, what Assad has done to his civilians in particular is at the top, there's a huge ungoverned space. There's actually more ungoverned space now than there was the day before 9-11. Iraqi Prime Minister Maliki's extreme anti-Sunni policies pushed people out to the side. ISIS also had the breaking the walls effort to break former fighters out of prison. Iraqi security force defections as part of the Sunni marginalization sent a lot of Iraqi special forces into ISIS and many other Ba'athist operators. Very good funding, local portfolio funding, not connected in a big way to the Gulf. The Gulf could have a leash that they could pull on militant groups in the past. Okay, we like what you're doing here, but now you're doing too much or you're turning your eyes on us. So folks in the Gulf would pull that leash. ISIS doesn't have that kind of funding. They have it locally. Granaries, oil, kidnap for ransom, extortion, antiquities, confiscations, all sorts of ways to raise money. The Declaration of the Caliphate, incredibly brilliant, especially as Arab countries were disintegrating, they established this place inside of which they want to hit the reset button on Islam and bring it back to the pure times of the Prophet Muhammad who died in 632 and before all what they call the innovations and all the changes and corruptions to the religion. <clears throat> uh, Anti-ISIS strategy, people really aren't into it. No one wants to get their nose in there. Uh, Turkey's foreign fighter policy also made it very difficult, and you have what we have today. Good fighters in ISIS, uh, they govern, and they win. A 16-year-old ISIS fighter that I interviewed joined them because they were the winning team. It's like a co college baseball player coming out and wanting to join the Yankees and the Red Sox because they're always in the lead, or whomever is the best. And that's what people want to do is join and sign up with number one. Uh, huge demographic and economic problems especially for men. Proxy boots, they failed our effort. We trained six that went into combat, six. So the real proxy boots are our Kurds, and therefore the rub with Turkey and the United States. Kill every ISIS and Al-Qaeda member tomorrow, and all of the factors that facilitated and enabled these groups are still there, all of them. <clears throat> no end, just an evolution. There's a fundraiser I went to in Kuwait which was a fascinating process of me being vetted to get inside of this fundraiser where they were raising money for Syrian groups and refugees, as they state on the sign here. Um, they raise a lot of money, and they exchange it, transfer it into high denomination dollars and euros. They tape them on the bodies of couriers, and they fly or walk them over the border with Turkey to support these groups. I went to Palmyra after meeting with Assad. Amazing ruins, absolutely phenomenal. ISIS got, has them now. Not only have they blown up sections of them, but at this amphitheater, they execute people on these stairs, seats. Foreign fighters, a huge component, 100 countries, 25 to 30,000 folks. Uh, they represent shrapnel out of the battlefield. They're going to come back at some point. Not all of them, but some will come home. Jamaz Lamia, militant group in Indonesia, was started partly through the skills and money coming out of Afghanistan. Nasser Abbas was an 18-year-old fighter in Afghanistan against the Soviets. He came back with $35,000, and JI has started. So big, big issue with returning fighters. And they do lots of things. They're not just cannon fodder. They are on top of uh, many of the groups. The overall commander, Shashani, is a Chechen foreign fighter inside of Syria actually from Georgia, but an ethnic Chechen. <clears throat> they bring home a lot of skills. They go from zero to hero. Oh, and by the way, four to 5,000 of them come from Europe, where you have 30 visa waiver countries. So they don't have to have an interview at the US consulate or embassy to get into the United States. They just hop on a plane. It's not that simple, but close. And the same time that all these Sunnis are creating a foreign fighter force, you have the Shiites doing the same thing to defend Shia sites and to fight Sunni extremists on behalf of Shias, which only represent 15% of Islam. Foreign fighters, 
took a picture of this, uh, of a phone with some video of this foreign fighter and medical records I got a copy of, of a British foreign fighter being treated in Turkish hospitals. Motivations, one of the most important things to discuss. Why are all these young guys going and some young women? Well, again, it's the zero to hero phenomenon. At home, the social contract's broken. There's nothing for you. Police stomp on your face. They break into your home. They steal things. The government's stealing corruption. And you have a lot of lack of things that we take for granted or that our families and our ancestors have fought for, dignity, respect, sense of purpose. They don't have that in many places. You go to the battlefield and you get it. And this is what they're looking for. And they're not going back. One of my fixers was a Syrian refugee. And he said, we don't know how to govern. Stop expecting us to govern. We don't have any experience choosing leaders or leaders or leading. But we will not go back to our cages, he told me. <clears throat> OK, think about those young people in that environment. And think about how intoxicating something like this would be. Could you put the lights down, please? Thanks. فخلافة لله عنوانها مرسومة أمجادها بدمائنا فتعاهدوا بالذود عن أركانها باعوا الحياة رخيصة لبقائها رص الصفوف رص الصفوف رص الصفوف بايع البغداد رص الصفوف now you're at home in Yemen, in Algeria, Indonesia, Afghanistan, Pakistan. You haven't received any education, or you have and there's no jobs. The police, the military, they've kicked down your doors. They've stolen your car. They've stolen money. They've stolen whatever. Repression, no sense of purpose, dignity. And you see this, and you can run, run and gun with ISIS and put it on the chin in the face of Shiites and Christians and Jews or other Sunnis or just anyone, and attain this kind of glory. You know, ISIS says to its recruits, tells them all the things it can do, both building the state and engaging in battle. And they say, when you go before Allah, don't you want these deeds in your scales? Very, very potent. So how do we counter them? Well, we don't have a lot of people on the ground, but we do have some exceptional people on the ground including Delta Force, which conducted the raid last May to get uh, the CFO of ISIS, the oil emir. Uh, we also drop weapons and supplies to the Kurds. This is boiling the blood of the Turks when they see this, funding what they consider their enemy. And we have Reapers. This is a Reaper. Predator is slightly different. There's a lot of controversy over these. Um, I'm not a big fan of extrajudicial killings. We consider this legitimate to kill individuals who've declared war on the United States, one of the few ways to take terrorists off the streets. And it keeps our guys out of harm's way by having no pilot. So switching gears here, environment, tremendous pressure all around. Good thing is we do have rising prosperity, but that means a tremendous drain on resources. The middle class is expanding in a huge way, and people want their luxury goods and their basic goods. The climate meeting, it was good, but there needs to be delivery there. Having the two largest economies in the world hold up on their end of the bargain is going to be key to all of that. Technology is one of the areas we can expect some tremendous impact here, and that's where I hold out hope for where we're going, because things do not look hopeful right now. We're one Celsius above the Industrial Revolution temperature. The two degree rise is the max before catastrophe. At current emissions, we go to 6 Celsius rise uniform across the planet by 2100. And even if the pledges are met, that's only 3.6. 
but that's considered the maximum. Last year, warmest year ever. Now, you may debate whether climate change is human caused or not, but we do know there's global warming, right? The mercury doesn't lie. We know the temperature's up. What causes it is open to debate, some believe, others don't believe so. But nonetheless, we've got some big problems. Energy, now, I happen to be a renewable energy fan, but I'm also a realist. And right now, we don't have the structures for shifting completely to renewables. We're a long way away from that. And I'm happy that we're sourcing a lot more energy inside the United States. Look at this huge increase just over a few years. Global picture, a lot more going into solar wind, but when you have the depressed price of oil, uh, it discourages people from investing in renewables. But here's the big issue. You remember the fat figures I gave, 750,000 Chinese debt each year, 235 billion in cost? Well, Xi Jinping has said, all right, we're gonna put 320 billion in the pollution cleanup over five years. Now, Penny Pritzker, the US Commerce Secretary, led a group of clean tech executives from California and other parts of the US to China last summer and said, we want in on that business and you need us, which they recognized. But they said, you have got to clean up your courts because whenever you're stealing intellectual property and we try to bring it to a court in China, guess who loses? Okay, so some courts in Shanghai have actually uh, made quite a difference and are starting to be pretty fair, but nonetheless, still a disadvantage. <clears throat> Picture I took out in Xinjiang, unbelievably massive open space full of wind farms. I, I was just amazed by it. Okay, here's one of your big problems. Finite amount of water, but population and middle class is growing. So tremendous scarcity. Yemen is one of the biggest problems. They put so much of their water into growing cot, the low-level narcotic that's chewed by lots of folks across the region. And they will run out of water and oil um, before you finish graduate school. And I know you're undergrads mostly, but by the time you get in grad school, Yemen will be done. Glacial recession in China, the Urupchi Glacier, lost about 40 feet over the last two decades, 40 feet of thickness, not being replaced. Water stress, yes here, yes there. Desalination is the solution in some places for some groups. It's very expensive. It has to be co-located with an, its own independent, dedicated energy source often because it is super energy intensive, creates a very toxic byproduct, but it is a solution. There's an Israeli company building one in San Diego right now. Okay, health, demographics, and food. Okay, just some of the major medical and health challenges out there. <clears throat> Antibiotic resistance to me is one of the scariest things that is at play today. Demographics, we just got back from Nigeria. They are shooting like a rocket past the United States. By 2050, they'll be up to 450 million people. Here's the growth rates. Nigeria, 176. We're going way up too. China, not too much. Big drops across this area here. This is one of the most frightening facts you can pick up today. Okay, that happens in a world with a finite amount of water. Okay, so we're gonna add a couple billion with the same amount of water on the planet. Aging, we're all living longer. How's this for a fact for you? That's what's happening in East Asia. No one's having kids. In China, because of preference for men over women, female infanticide, uh, abortions, sex-selective abortions, has left China with about 30 million men of marrying age without a female counterpart, which is why you have bride kidnapping across Southeast Asia. Food, okay, population's going up 2 billion, but that's out of 7.2 billion today, so not a huge percentage, but a good amount. Why is food production having to go up 79% by 2050? Middle class. We're going to add two to three billion people to the middle class. 
And that means people want meat. When people go to the middle class, they eat meat. Protein consumption goes way up. 1980, average Chinese individual was eating 44 pounds of meat a year. Add 100 pounds to it today. Okay, that takes a lot of water, energy, land, packaging. Great opportunities for business. Great for giving people something that they've been yearning for, but with a huge impact. How do you get around it? Crickets. Yeah, in much of the world, a lot of crickets being raised because huge amount of protein for 100% less greenhouse gas, 2,000 times less water, 3x less waste. And I was just in Niger, and everywhere were cricket markets. It was incredible. And don't pee or you pay 4,000 francs. <clears throat> okay, transnational organized crime. As the world has been focused on counterterrorism, organized crime groups have been having a ball and making a lot of money, trillions of dollars each year. It's an incredible amount of the global economy. And part of it is corruption, there's state capture. Who's running the drugs in Central Asia? Family members and the entourages of the governing families, okay? And that's not just in Central Asia and lots of other places. And they're all over the place and they're doing everything you can imagine. This is Mighty Nepal. This is a group that won a CNN Hero Award. I went to see them on the border with Nepal and India and women staff these interdiction booths and when they see women physically being carried over the border, they physically interdict the trafficker. These are extremely brave women. Blurry picture, I was in the back of a tinted SUV taking pictures as I drove through a very, very scary place called Eastley. And it's where huge amounts of Somali pirate money are laundered and where cot is traded and brought into Somalia from Mount Kenya. And that is a big shipment of cot. Nice sub, right? For the Colombian Navy? Nope. Narco sub, 20 tons of cocaine on board, brought to the US. Impossible to see a small sub. And that's a really big modern version. Most of them are really rudimentary and are impossible to see. Okay, if you're corrupt, you're probably gonna have some instability. If you're not corrupt, no instability. Denmark, New Zealand, Singapore, Finland, Sweden. Those are the countries that are least corrupt in the world and they have the least stability. Now, it's not the only factor in whether you're a stable country or not, but corruption plays a big role. US is not doing too bad. China is about mid-range. No surprise down here. Cyber, five domains of warfare, land, sea, airspace, now cyber. Trajectory, vertical. It's growing and growing and growing every day at extremely high rates. We have a lot of examples of it being used. The best known, of course, is Stuxnet, where someone got a flash drive or something else into the nuclear facilities in Iran and manipulated the Siemens Corporation industrial control software, sent fake messages to the Iranian controllers saying the centrifuges are spinning at an acceptable rate in the safe zone, but instead spun them up at an unsustainable speed and blew up 2,000 of them, which was really quite a great move, but Stuxnet has shown up in lots of other places around the world now. And the Iranians can hit back and wiped out 40,000 hard drives at Aramco with their bug. Okay, some views from across the globe. I'll give you about one third of what I'll give tomorrow, but these are some good ones. This is Kobani, the town inside Syria that got pulverized. This is Turkey, that's Syria. That's a Turkish gendarme. These are people rolling back in. Gun shop in Saruch, which got hit last uh, May, I think it was, 30 killed. 16-year-old ISIS fighter I interviewed, the Nusra Front, social media king that I met, remarkable conversation with him. We have overlapping interests, Nusra Front in the United States. Killing ISIS, killing Assad. We should be working together. That was his message over two hours to me. Kurdish youth militia, the leader of the PKK, Turkish Kurdish militant group, Abdullah Ocalan. We are everywhere. This is on the border. 
<clears throat> trafficker who I interviewed twice. Traffic's in everything, but specialty is in visa waiver passports. Kids at refugee camps in Zatri and Jordan. Now, walking around the camp, I have an interpreter with me, and he said, I'm going to show you a few signs that tell you these people know they're going to be here for a long time. First one is this, an advertisement for circumcision. Now, if you think you're going to be there for a month, you wouldn't see a sign like this. People know they're going to be there for a long time. Second, as soon as ISIS and other groups defeated Hezbollah at Kalamun and then at an air base, everyone in the camp started to build gardens. They knew they were not going to go back to Syria for a very long time. <clears throat> Over the summer last year, in Sousse, Tunisia, one militant comes to this beach and shoots 30 Brits and eight others, or six others. Oops, sorry about that. So I went there, the resort is deserted. And it has hit the economy very hard. In Tunisia for the foreign fighter study, we talked to a documentary filmmaker. He said, hey, come see one of my assistants, a buddy of his who was in San Francisco's Golden Gate Park six months ago is now writing to him as I was there with him from Syria. He's joined ISIS. Came to the West, delivered pizza in San Francisco, winds up in ISIS in Syria as an ISIS fighter. <clears throat> then went down to Karawan, interviewed this father whose son joined ISIS, was recruited outside his mosque, went to Kirkuk, Iraq, blew himself up, killed two Peshmerga. Then I interviewed his two other sons. He had four sons, one daughter, only one kid employed. This kid went to Benghazi to join a group, got cold feet, and came home. Mali in northeast Mali called Gao, huge war zone, just like the combination of the oil here and the army rucksacks. This is from the men's bathroom at the airport in Gao, where 20 millimeter rounds have pulverized the structure. That's the hole I took the picture out of. This is an MRAP, mine resistant ambush protected vehicle that got smoked by landmine. This is in Afghanistan, my fixer, me, of course, the most famous Nat Geo picture of the Afghan girl. Okay, not a lot of good news, for sure. Uh, a system that is out of disorder, big powers contesting it, small powers contesting it. A lot of extremism in all realms. China, yes, a, definitely a major part of the global community. It's taken decades to get there, but also acting out in some ways. The U.S. remains indispensable, but we definitely can cause part of the problems. There's no doubt about it. We're in it to win it, but we're out there fighting aggressively too. Antibiotic resistance, very, very key. Everything is fluid and dynamic. Tech tools in the hands of everyone and terrible conditions for folks at the bottom. So some of your takeaways, yeah, pretty clear. An unstable world, tremendous array of threats. Um, the conditions, again, are not going away that enabled ISIS and Al-Qaeda to be where they are today. Government is a solution and a problem. And it's not just young men in the Islamic world, but everywhere that lack the means to move forward and women too, but it's about the men in a lot of these places. And what they sense is their obligation and their frustration. And there's so many other solutions other than the military. In some places, yes, SEAL teams, deltas, drones, that's what you need. In other places, it's education. It's an end of ignorance. It is development assistance, foreign aid, jobs. Prognosis, not very good. We'll open it up to questions. So we now have time for questions. So if you have one, please raise your hand, and Schwen or I will come to you. And please, please mention where you're from. Hi, thank you yes. for your talk again. Um, so I'm from Massachusetts, and a lot of this has got me thinking, uh, especially referring to the slides where you talk about corruption 
um, and how it breeds instability and then organized crime networks as well. It seems to me, and perhaps this is a lot of correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems to me as though these corrupt networks and the organized crime function hand in hand and it's driven by the ability to sort of pocket money and cash that they get, that they acquire through coercion or through um, means which are not necessarily legitimate and the ability to hide that money into different areas. Um, it, as far as I'm aware, there is no uh, law which requires a name or a specific person to be written down in certain records when companies or individuals try and purchase assets through cash and would something such as a law which requires individuals to have their name tied to cash asset purchases where they're trying to hide this money be a functional way of keeping track of these corrupt individuals in the criminal networks? There's only a certain amount we're ever going to be able to clean up. It is so bad, and one of the big reasons is state capture, is the states are in on it. Governments are in on it. Your proposal, yes, it would be good, but you have to enforce the laws that are on the books. And it's difficult when crime and terrorism, but crime in this case, are transborder. You have to work with another country. They have to have laws that dovetail with yours, hot pursuit over a border for physical apprehension. Really difficult to get at the problem but it would be so much less difficult if you did not have corrupt government. Organized crime would have so fewer chances to succeed without government helping them do it. And th this is the issue, why you need an independent and free media and judiciary and transparency in government so that people feel that they can't get away with stealing money and allowing organized crime groups to use their territory. A 727, Boeing 727 with 4,000 kilos of cocaine flew from South America to Mali and landed there, and the cocaine was to be trafficked up, to, up into Europe. They had a little problem once they landed, but normally this happens. People know it's flying in. The air forces of these countries know it's flying in, okay? But someone at the top says, at 12 a.m., this aircraft's gonna be entering our airspace. Don't touch it, okay? That's corruption in government. I, I just with so many of these problems, I don't mean to be so negative, but it is, it is pretty ugly out there. I don't see that going away. I just don't. There's too many incentives to keep it going by the people in power. Good evening. Uh, thank you so much for yeah. coming and speaking with us this evening. I'm from Oregon and I study here at CMC. Great, and where are you from? From Oregon. From Oregon, okay. Um, my question to you regards the efficacy of sanctions, specifically with regards to Russia. As I'm okay. sure you know, uh, following oil sanctions from the U.S. and European countries, the Russian currency was in a free fall until their relatively unprecedented mo monetary policy intervened. Uh, during your speech, you noted both that their foreign, uh, foreign ex uh, currency reserves are dwindling, but also um, that they have access to other means of economic growth, such as energy deals with China. Um, and so my question is, given that context, to what degree are either the current sanctions or potentially new sanctions uh, going to be effective in eroding Russian power? The, the current sanctions are effective. They are not a panacea. They have not ejected Russia from Ukraine or Crimea. Um, but they are effective, and they're effective because they are preventing technology and capital from going into Russia. And Russia cannot modernize its energy infrastructure without Western technology. The Chinese do not have it. The Chinese have money to buy Russian energy, but the Russian budget is in such terrible shape, they have to put the money towards that. They can't put it in, they can't invest it. Investment is leaving. China, Russia has just told several state-owned enterprises, you're going on the sale block. We need the money. So Russia's in a lot of trouble over this. Again, it's a country that sustained 25 million dead in World War II out of a total 55 million dead worldwide. This is a country that knows how to suffer and survive. Okay, and they will do that for a long time, but they are definitely hurting, for sure. More sanctions could work. Uh, the US has not tabled this, but the Russians have already signaled that it would be considered a nuclear option if we kept them out of the SWIFT uh, financial exchange in Belgium and did not allow them to clear their, uh, their transactions in that that would absolutely paralyze their economy. We have not done that. Thank you for your talk. Um, I'm from San Antonio, Texas. Yep. And 
my question for you is, given the state of the world with all its problems, in your opinion, what country under what leadership, including the U.S. with the upcoming elections and change in leadership, what country with what leadership do you think is best poised to guide some type of stabilizing ideology through the world? To guide and stabilize an ideology? Guide a stabilizing e okay. ideology. Any, any idea, or yeah. either country or group, what, what group with what leadership do you think is most poised to bring some stabilization to the world today? I know it it's a big it, question. It, it, it remains the United States, but the US can't do it alone, and not everyone agrees with what the United States promotes. Uh, but nonetheless, we are still in that position, and lots of countries want us to take a more assertive role in establishing a more stable system. Others do not, for China, for sure. Um, could a group of countries do it? Could a group of transparent, uh, less than corrupt countries do it? Maybe Japan, the US, uh, Europe, but then countries that are not in it feel that they're being marginalized or that it's targeted against them. I, I really don't have a lot of faith in um, the stability of the system right now. I don't think it's going to collapse and we're going to have total anarchy, but I think we're still at a stage where we're still unwinding from the tightly wound ball that the world was in the Cold War, where everyone stayed in their little position. Um, and we're going to see this unwinding for a long time. And that is because all these countries see themselves being able to act in ways they couldn't before and assert themselves and get things. But it's a dangerous world for them too because now Everyone else is doing it, so you can have fights without the U.S. or the Russians or others coming to your rescue. But chaos ahead is what I would say. I'll, yeah. I'll let you guys choose the speakers. Uh, my name is Grayson. I'm from Virginia. Um, you've spoken a lot about, obviously, some really somber points on our timeline. Uh, what, what are the things you're most excited about or hopeful about in the next, in the next year, in the next 10 years or 100 years? Um, Te technological solutions to problems. That's where we have a lot of hope. Um, technology is a double-edged sword. You know, you can use it for good or bad, and a lot of technology will be used for good, for finding solutions to climate change, to efficiency issues, to healthcare problems, to food and water issues. Uh, so I'm confident that technology will bring us to a place uh, where we are not now. And so I'm encouraged about that. I'm encouraged about the fact that two years ago, 830, 840 million people went hungry every single day consistently. And it's now down to 660 million. That's good. Uh, HIV, tremendous strides against HIV. Uh, other diseases and pandemics are going in a different direction. But, so there's some good stories in healthcare, but the antibiotic resistance is that um, that black lining in, in the uh, otherwise nice uh, story we've seen. Those are a couple. Hi, uh, thank you for your talk. Um, I'm from Southern California. So my question was, you know, you talked a lot about corruption, especially in the Middle East, and how that has helped ISIS, ISIL spread. Do you think that as America, we should just accept ISIS as a legitimate country, let them kind of get the land, make them part of the UN, and, you know, impose some um, rules on them that you can't like kill women on the street or just uh, engage in mass massacres. Um, but do you think that if we do recognize them as a country, it would be a better solution for us, uh, saving us billions of dollars, uh, kind of make America possibly look as a beneficial actor in the world? Yeah. People have suggested that. I, I think it would be a mistake to recognize a, a group now that is still a terrorist group and is doing some incredibly vicious things, including theologically sanctioned rape of Yazidi women. So it'd be kind of hard to recognize a group that does that, but there may be an inevitability about this in that, again, this is a rising entity. I don't think they're gonna be around forever, but they're a rising entity amid collapsing entities, corrupt states. So there could be uh, an inevitability, as I said, about this in where at some point there's recognition or just you engage the group because you have to, and whether you call them a state or not, you're dealing with them. And where they've dropped all of these horrible things that they're using to attract men, to scare people, to establish their state, 
and uh, where they could become maybe just a moderately violent group in the future, like lots of states. And I, I gotta tell you, there's lots of states that do the same things that the Islamic State does to people in their own country. And we recognize them and we deal with them and they're in that region and they're in other regions. Hi, I'm Dan from Pennsylvania. Uh, this question probably dovetails a little bit, actually. Uh, I was wondering what you foresaw um, as America's future actions uh, regarding the situation in the Middle East, especially with ISIS, um, and whether or not you think this coming election will be uh, influential in that matter. Very general. Yeah, I didn't hear the, the word used. What? Oh, just future action, what strategy we oh. uh, will be enacting. We, we don't have a good strategy and policy towards the Middle East. We really don't, and um, it's first of all very difficult to develop one. But you know, the president's point of view on some engagement in the Middle East and on the military side has been a wise one, though with its problems. Um, I think whether we get Hillary Clinton or Marco Rubio or Ted Cruz, we're going to have more robust engagement. All of them are, you know, more likely to have a more assertive disposition towards the Middle East. Um, I'm not confident that it's going to solve any problems. The Israeli-Palestinian problem, I mean, how many chances have we had to solve it? It's just, it's not going anywhere. Uh, we have a hugely imperfect partner in Saudi Arabia. Okay, that's not changing. Even if we sourced all oil from the United States, Saudi Arabia would still be a pivotal player in the Middle East that we would have to partner with. Um, I'm not Again, I don't mean to be so pessimistic about everything, but it is not good out there, and we are not deft at handling the Middle East. We have some good people, some good policies, some good policy makers, um, many of them actually, but it's a very difficult environment in which to operate, and a lot of partners that don't want to be good partners um, in tremendous demographic issues and job issues. It's just a, it's a poisoned atmosphere, and it's very hard to operate there. But I don't think we've also done a good job in opportunities that we did have. Hi, thank you for your talk. I'm from Northern California. Um, I uh, thank you also for mentioning eating insects within the framework of global security. <laughs> Absolutely. Cricket granola bars. Yes. Oh, they're there. A CMC alum, if anyone, uh, Chapool, Google. <laughs> um, Anyway, uh, I was interested in sort of, um, with global sea level rise, that that in, is- In what? Global sea level rise. Oh, okay. Yep. That that's expected to sort of create a refugee crisis that will outstrip even the one in Syria right now. And that I'm, I'm curious, uh, with sort of the refugee crises that will ensue, are there any areas that are anticipated to become more destabilized in security sense versus just sort of displacing people? Bangladesh, for sure. 160 million people, much of the country below sea level. Where do they go? It's gonna be a huge problem in Bangladesh, but lots of other places. Um, you know, we, we do have sea level rise. We have a massive amount of the world's GDP and population on the coasts all around the world. It's where people build infrastructure it's where ports are, where trade is conducted. It's a huge problem. It's already underway, and solving is going to cost trillions of dollars. I mean, that's it in short, but Bangladesh would be the country I've chosen. And they've done some amazing things recently with de economic development and healthcare, but they have a rise in extremism. Lots of folks have been killed there just in the past few uh, weeks liberal writers, uh, tourists from Japan and other places in Asia. We've got a lot of problems in, uh, in Bangladesh. A huge number of people in a small area with much of it below sea level. That's not a good combination. Hello, Mr. Sanderson. Thank you for your talk. Uh, despite your ending prognosis, I actually <laughs> really enjoyed it. Great. I wanted to ask you about the interview process because you've interviewed people that are uh, very influential, like President Assad, but you've also in, uh, interviewed people who are just Syrian fighters, locals on the ground, and I was wondering how you take 
the information that you have from these interviews and quantify it, right? As an analyst, something isn't useful to you unless you're able to confirm it or utilize it in some way. So what's the purpose of interviewing normal people? Sure, so what we do is qualitative research. We don't do quantitative research, my team doesn't. I don't go out to interview 1,000 refugees and then take from that sample uh, a, a direction that I can use to influence a policymaker. I go out and talk to a spectrum of individuals, host nation security services, insurgents, all the people that were listed uh, at the outset to get 10, 12, 20 different perspectives on the same issue so that I can then better inform my sense of the problem, bring it back and sit down with intelligence folks, with policymakers, with the media, with the private sector, with students, and just bring perspectives back to enrich your sense of the issues. It's not about conducting the quantitative research for, for my group and many, many groups at think tanks. It's very qualitative in nature. Um, and we think it's very valuable and we know it's valuable because they can, all of these audience continu continually ask us to come back after each trip and after each project to give them briefings on what's going on. So I just briefed the, one of the top writers at the New York Times, Eric Schmidt. He's on the front page almost every day writing about <clears throat> global security issues. He's fantastic and one of the best in the business. And he just came by last week to sit down to talk to us, myself and Jennifer Cook, our Africa program chief who went to Nigeria, Niger and Mali with me. He's going there and we spent an hour on the couch talking about what we saw there. And that was to help inform him. I gave him business cards of contacts he spoke with. So it was about enabling his particular job at this point. You know, we work closely with the media to provide expert commentary. So those are the kind of things we do. I was at the National Counterterrorism Center this week in December at the CIA, at the National Intelligence Council, which is the CIA's think tank. And you sit down with them and they say, look, you know, we're looking at these issues, but we'd love to talk to outsiders to see if you're finding different perspectives that can help us develop a fuller picture. And that's part of how we make a difference. And we do it with lots of countries uh, because we know that there's a lot of people that need to contribute to this. So that, that's how we do it and that's how we make it valuable is just providing our impressions uh, to folks. We don't, again, try to interview uh, a thousand people on one particular issue in order to get uh, an appropriate sample. This will be our last question. Okay. Hello, Mr. Sanderson. Uh, my name is Tim Gallagher and I'm from Stowe, Vermont. Um, so my question was, how do superpowers, I guess like the U.S., who have um, really good technology and things like that, prevent themselves from the 1% chance that there is uh, a terrorist attack, and how would you propose to, I guess, cripple these organizations throughout the world? <clears throat> well, it depends on what group you're talking about, what potential target, what type of weapon or means they plan to use. Intelligence is critical here. Now, when we were in Iraq, which again was a huge mess, hugely expensive, we had guys on the ground and we developed great intelligence. That was one of the benefits of being there, but by being there, we generated the problem about which we needed the intelligence, so it's kind of self-defeating. Um, but nonetheless, by being on the ground there, we had incredible relationships with Sunni tribes, and we picked up incredible intelligence from them. That's how you help defeat a group, among many, many other things, um, including trying to show the hollowness of the ideology, of showing the brutality of the group, of bringing in lots of different partners on this, but having eyes and ears on the ground and in the air, having good partners on the ground, using your special mission forces, that's deltas and seals, to actually go in and do the jobs they were trained to do and signed up to do, which is kill or capture really bad people. Use drones, use other standoff weapons. Um, there's lots of things you can do. Development, give people a reason to turn against the bad guys. Roads, jobs, engagement, uh, reverse marginalization. Lots of things that you can do on military and non-military levels. But if you're going after, if you're talking about the kinetic side, you need the intelligence so that you can target properly, and then you need to use your assets. And that's, to me, drones, special operations, um, and others. 
Thanks for being a great audience. This is a fantastic school, incredible students. Hope to engage you more. And let me know if you're coming to DC for an internship. Come by CSIS. Michael and Christine will attest to uh, the great experience there. But just uh, get overseas. And for those of you who are from overseas, get to another country for your internships. That is the number one thing you can do. And read, read the news. Financial Times, Economist, Economist South China Morning Post, you name it. Just read, 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 and visit and engage. Thank you. Thank you.